Hello and welcome to lecture 71 of my course from data to decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your instructor, and this lecture is on response surface modeling, part of our series on design of experiments. In the last few lectures and uh, explanations using R, we looked at factorial designs, full factorial designs, fractional factorial designs, and in particular, two-level factorials were used to screen variables and to spot linear trends. We can, depending on how fractional we get with our factorial design, also uh, investigate interactions between our variables. But they are limited to linear trends only. We're basically asking simple questions like, does this variable significantly impact the response? And if so, in what direction does it move? What kind of overall magnitude? of change do we get with particular variables. Often we use the two-level factorial to help us define the next experiment. Well, in response surface modeling or response surface methodology, we look for higher order trends, in particular quadratic trends. Those are the most common in doing response surface modeling. Here we've hopefully already done a screening experiment. We've figured out which variables are significant. And then we can add more data to be able to do a second order model. Why second order? Well, one of the advantages of a second order, even though it's often an approximation uh, to behavior in real life, is that second order responses always have a stationary point. That is a minimum, a maximum, a saddle point. And quite frequently, our purposes in doing this uh, design of experiments is to help us find the optimum. Uh, the place where yield is maximized or failure rate is minimized or um, some other desirable property is achieved. Uh, with a quadratic, we're always guaranteed exactly one minimum. Now that's an advantage, but it can also be a disadvantage because if our behavior is more complicated, maybe there isn't just one optimum place. Uh, and um, we won't see that if we only look in a quadratic way. Nonetheless, it is a step beyond uh, our description of the process than we get with just a two-level factorial. A general second-order model, if I were to write out all the terms, would look something like this. Um, if we have k factors, I'll have k first-order terms, and then I'll have another k second order terms, that is all the squared terms, and then I'll have all the interactions between those k factors. We can express that in a matrix form, something like this. I'll put it up there just for your reference. We're not going to use that. But you can see that there are quite a few possibilities in the modeling when we add the second order as well as the interaction terms. A common way that most of us learned in our introductory science classes and maybe physics laboratories or chemistry laboratories or something like that, we learned to change variables one at a time. And this is kind of an intuitive way of thinking about it. If I change, say, just the temperature holding everything else in my experiment constant, and I find that there is a maximum, in this case, maybe the yield of some product that I'm making, there's a maximum, I say, oh, well, there's the best temperature. But I had to hold all the other variables constant because I'm, I'm trying this one at a time variable approach. Likewise, I could hold temperature constant, and then I could vary the concentration and say, oh, well, there's the best concentration to use. Uh, this one at a time variable approach, though, ignores interactions. So if I showed you these two graphs and asked you, what's the optimum process conditions? Well, what would you say? Would you say, oh, well, uh, it's 184 degrees centigrade and it's 26% uh, concentration? Right? That might be a simple minded way to go. But if we look at the full response, including interactions, we'll get a graph like this. Here I have contours of constant yield as a function of concentration and temperature, and the optimums over here. What optimum do we pick before? Well, we picked 184 degrees, 184, 26% concentration, 
this point. How did we arrive? Oops, I'm sorry, this point, 184.26. How did we arrive at this point? Well, we varied concentration at a constant temperature, and then we varied uh, temperature at a constant concentration, and uh, somehow we, 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 just from those particular cuts, we came with this optimum. But if I had picked a different temperature or a different concentration to do my one at a time variation, I'd get a different answer. And none of them would be the true answer unless I got very, very lucky with the temperature and concentration I picked. So a response with interactions requires more than just one at a time variable behavior. And often, as shown in this example, these uh, responses with interactions include uh, optimums, where a second order behavior is observed. So what can we do? One approach is called the central composite design. It begins with the two-level factorial design that we've already done. So suppose we do a screening experiment. We, we guess at all the variables, all the factors that we think are going to be important. We do a two-level factorial design, picking what we think are reasonable ranges, uh, minimums and maximums for each of the factors. We perform our full factorial experiment. Now we've realized that a couple of those variables are no longer are not significant, so we drop them out. And what's left, though, is a smaller two-level factorial design. We've already collected that data. Let's add some extra points. We can add a center point right in the middle of all the other points, and then we will, as I'll explain later, uh, perform some repeats of that measurement as well. And we'll add axial points or star points, they're sometimes called. This is the center point except for one of the variables is changed plus and minus to some extreme values. There'll be a couple of choices that we can use for that extreme value that I'll mention. And we do this for all variables. Here's an example with just two variables, right? So I've got my two level factorial design with two variables, x1 and x2. Then I'll collect a center point and four extreme points and combine them this becomes then all the data points that I've collected by design. If I have two actors, then the number of data points I collect here is the same as a three level factorial design. But if I have three factors or more, then a three level factorial design, full factorial design, will collect a lot more data points then I would collect if I did on one of these uh, central composite designs. We'll see that in just the next moment. Um, here are two examples of central composite designs. First one is what we just saw in the previous graph, where I've got a two-level full factorial design. I add these actual points, and I specifically pick the extremeness of my axial star points to be on a circle that is circumscribed on the outside of all of my data. Right? Uh, so in fact, every one of these data points is the same distance away from the center. That's called a circumscribed. I could also do an inscribed design. Uh, it's, it's not much different except for uh, the Axial points are at the what would normally be the extremes here, here, and here, 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 the plus or minus one extremes. And then I inscribe my factorial design inside of that, but it's still the same thing. All the data points are the same distance away from the center. This distance away is. 2k over 4, where k is the number of factors. So for a two-factor design, this, is, this distance is the square root of 2, uh, everything being normalized to plus or minus 1, my original two-level factorial design. Another approach is the composite face-centered design, central composite face-centered design, where my axial points are right on the line segments Affecting all of my original factorial design. So it's right in the middle. It's in the center of the faces. So here's a three factor example. 
uh, where I have the central point, and then every point, this one here, is in the center of a face of one of these uh, sides of the cube. Now you'll notice here that the number of data points in this three level central posit design is less than I would get if I did a three level, three factor full factorial design. Right? Uh, three levels, three factors would be three to the third or 27 data points. Here I've got uh, eight for my original and one, two, three, four, five, six, another seven, so 15. So close to half the amount of data points than if I did a full factorial design with three levels. That's the reason why we picked these kinds of designs, like a central composite design, reduce the number of experiments we have to run to fill out our experimental space. Note that the number of data points is going to be 2 to the k, that is the number used in your full factorial uh, with two levels. And 2k, those are all the axial points that I'm adding, the star points. And then 1 for the center. Of course, if I have, I have repeats, I'll have to add the number of repeats to the center. And that becomes the number of experimental data points that we measure. Another design that is somewhat popular because it allows even less data points is the box Benkin design. You put a data point in the center, and then you put one at the midpoints of each end, edge of the process space. Here, here, here. All right? So uh, note, note that they're not in the center of the face, but they're the center of every edge. So think about this square that represents one face of the cube, and along every edge in the center, I put a data point. This gives me a few um, less data points than I do even with a central composite design. But it has a couple of disadvantages. It does not contain an embedded factorial design. So the, the idea I mentioned before of I, I do a factorial design, I look at the data, I, I figure out what factors I might be able to ignore, and then I add to that the central and axial points to create my central composite design. I can't do that here. I, I basically am starting just with this design, and I don't have maybe the advantage of doing the experiment in two steps. So advantages and disadvantages. Note that, the, note that there are no extreme points, no corner points in this design. Often we repeat the center points. That is, we measure the central point multiple times. We do this in a special way, though. We don't randomize the measurement of the center points like we do everything else. All the other points in our design are going to be randomized so that we run them in a random order. But because we're repeating the central point multiple times, we're going to use that repeating nature of those measurements to help us detect things like drift, systematic changes in the process. Uh, so the repeated center points will always be the first point I run and the last point I run. And then how many ever we decide to run, we'll evenly space them throughout the run of all the other experiments. Then if we pull out just those central points and plot them over time, we can see if we have any systematic drift or maybe a, something went wrong in a process and we got a shift uh, we can detect these kinds of things. So we're going to use this repeated center points specifically to detect uh, process instabilities, drifts, etc. How many repeated points do we do? Uh, how many do we measure? Well, there's a, a, a reason why we pick a certain number, and that is to create uniform precision. The uncertainty of prediction is a function of how far away you are from the center because the outer points in your design have more leverage than the central point. So how much that center point influences the design will be reduced uh, compared to the outer points because the outer points have the higher leverage, just like we saw with linear regression. 
Therefore, we can create, create more uniform precision by increasing the number of measurements of that center point until the variance of the prediction is the same at the center as it is at the corners. And we use this desire for uniform precision to help guide us decide how many repeated center points to measure. Now, whenever we're doing response surface methodology, there are certain properties we're looking for. We try to achieve all four of these properties. First is orthogonality. As we've seen many, many times before, we would love it if all of our factors are uncorrelated. It just makes analysis and interpretation of the results uh, easier and more reliable. We would also like, like our design to be rotatable. Now that's a kind of a graphical view, but what that really means is uh, our design is rotatable if the variance of the predicted response at any point depends only on the distance of that point from the center in our three-dimensional space. Uh, the best way to think about it, or multi-dimensional space, the best way to think about it is if I've normalized everything from plus to minus one, zero is the center, then you can think of it as a, a, a unit circle or a unit sphere or a unit multi-dimensional <laughs> sphere. And uh, variance of the predicted response in a rotatable design is only a function of how far away you are from the center, not in what direction you're moving. Moving along the x-axis or along the, the x1 axis or the x2 axis, it doesn't matter. It's only the distance away. If you have a first order linear model, then all orthogonal designs are also rotatable. When I go to higher orders, like a second order quadratic model, then that's not necessarily true. For example, the central composite face center design is not rotatable, whereas the central composite circumscribed design is. You can almost see that graphically when you go back and look at the pictures of those two designs. Um, another property we look for is uniformity, and we just discussed that. We pick the number of center points to run order to create uniform precision. And finally, we're looking for efficiency. What's the smallest number of experimental runs that we have to, we have to perform in order to achieve our research goals? All right, a few final notes before we finish up on response surface modeling. First, beware of extrapolation. If you fit a quadratic to your data, you will always find some stationary points, such as a min or a max, SATA point, something like that. But it's not guaranteed that that stationary point will be within the experimental space that you've measured. That is, it could be extrapolating a minimum outside of the space that you've made measurements on. Don't trust an extrapolated minimum, maximum. You simply can't trust it. Uh, the uncertainty in, in that extrapolation is huge. Uh, if you find that that stationary point is outside the experimental space, you may need to ch change the range to capture that stationary uh, point. Multiple responses. Sometimes we're trying to optimize more than one thing at once. And maybe the thing that, that maximizes yield is not the thing that minimizes cost, uh, for example. So with multiple responses, you might try overlapping response contour plots or uh, maybe come up with a composite a, a cost function or, or um, a metric of success. And finally, sometimes uh, it's useful to use principal component analysis combined with response surface modeling uh, to find the optimal. We won't touch on that topic, but uh, you will see some people doing that. All right, let's look at what we have learned in Lecture 71. As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, please go back and review the material. When is response surface modeling preferred over two-level full factorial designs? What's wrong with varying our factors one at a time? We've done it all of our lives. Why are we going to stop now? Describe some of the RSM designs we have discussed.
Why are center points often repeated in response surface modeling? And finally, what are the four properties we can look for that we look for in RSM? Next time, we'll finish up with some final thoughts on design of experiments. Till then.